right, welcome to Christine's Corner. We have a returning guest who, who's been going to read you some bedtime stories, some old time bed stories. Aren't they, won't that be fun? Oh, oh, oh. oh my God! Merry Christmas, Christine. It's Santa. Merry Christmas, boys and girls. I figured Hi. I'd make a surprise visit. Wow. Hi, Dean. Hello, Santa. How did you get here? Uh, in the sleigh. In the sleigh? Yeah. Wow, and no snow. Anything you want to tell the boys and girls out there? Uh, don't be naughty and be nice. Be nice for mom and dad. I'm sure there's a lot of good you out there. Thank you, Santa, for stopping in. What oh, a surprise. Oh, oh, oh. Boys and girls. Wow. Okay. Bye, Santa. Wow, wasn't that special? Santa Claus arrived. Wow, I wonder if he will next time. So my guest to my left is Jean Kelly, who's retired, uh, retired Plainville librarian. librarian. Uh, and she's going to read you a couple of books. And take it away, Jean. Thank you, Chris. It's lovely to be back on your wonderful show. Baseball is a favorite sport across the United States, and everybody has their favorite team that they root for and hope they're going to win the World Series. This year, it was the Boston Red Sox. But even so, everybody loves their mm. team. So our first book tonight is going to be a book about baseball. And this was something that happened a while ago. This is the story of a remarkable baseball team from Springfield, Massachusetts. And the star player, a boy named Bunny, who was the only African American on the team. The year was 1934 a time very different from today. Throughout much of the United States, and especially in the South, white children and black children went to separate schools. Many businesses, including hotels and restaurants, refused to serve black people. They even had to drink from different water fountains. In those days, no major league baseball teams had black players. It was not until 1947 that a talented second baseman named Jackie Robinson was signed to the Brooklyn Dodgers. Jackie became the first African-American to play in the modern major leagues. People were fighting for equal rights off the field as well as on. In 1955, a courageous black woman named Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to move to the back of the bus. The seats in the front were reserved for white people. On August the 28th, 1963, more than 300,000 people marched with Dr. Martin Luther King Junior to the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. On that hot summer afternoon, Dr. King delivered historic I Have a Dream speech, calling for a day when people will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content, content of their character. Although the story of Bunny Talafiero and his remarkable Springfield team is not widely known. It honors and celebrates an important event in the history of America's struggle for racial equality. And this is the book, A Home Run for Bunny, and it was written by Richard Anderson. I never liked Bunny Taylor Farrow. How, how could you with a name like Bunny? He wasn't even Italian. His real name was Ernest, but everybody called him Bunny because all he did was run. Everywhere, 
to and from school on errands for his mum and dad. He even ran around the block while waiting for his friends to come out and play. Yes, Bunny could run fast and he could throw too. When we were only eight, I saw him hurl a snowball from across his backyard to keep a squirrel from stealing his bird seed. Bunny's first baseball mitt was the old fashioned kind with three fingers. His mum had to stuff it with rags and lace it back up before he could use it. An old tire his dad hung from a tree in their backyard became Bunny's first strike zone. I was as good as a pitcher as Bunny, but he was the one who made history. At Springfield Tech, he became the first freshman ever to earn varsity letters in football, basketball, and baseball. And Bunny didn't just letter, he was the star. When our schools met in the city football championship, Bunny rushed for more yards than all our running backs combined. We never see anybody who could run as fast. Even the newspapers started calling him Bunny. Bunny 21, Cathedral 7, ran the headline. Bunny was the youngest player on his basketball squad, but that didn't stop him from scoring more points than anyone else on the team. He also led the league in steals. Four of them came off me in one game, but baseball was Bunny's specialty. Throw strikes came across as easy to him as hurling hardballs through that old tire in his backyard. As a freshman, he went undefeated and pitched a complete game every time he took the mound. When he wasn't pitching, Bunny played center field and batted over 400. He had more hits, scored more runs, and stole more bases than anybody else on the team. The only thing he didn't do was strike out. Baseball was my specialty too. And though my team wasn't as good as Bonnie's, we won every game I pitched. When the school season ended, we were both picked for the American League All-Star team. Who would have guessed we'd wind up wearing the same colors after competing against each other so many times. Both of us pitched really well all summer, but I had to warm the bench between my starts while Bunny made a name for himself playing center field. With his amazing speed, he was able to catch balls other outfielders could never have reached. He also threw out a lot of base runners who normally would have been safe. I hated to admit it, but Bunny really was the better athlete. Our team lost only once all summer, and it was one of the games I pitched, wouldn't you know it? After taking the title league, we sailed through the Massachusetts Championship Series with Bunny tossing shutouts in both games. Bunny pitched another shutout in the opening game of the New England Championship Series, along with stroking two home runs and stealing six bases. He even pitched off a runner at third. How often have you seen a pitcher do that? The next day, I did something Bunny never did. Allow only four hits and one walk in an 11 innings shutout. Next stop, the Eastern Regionals in Gastonia, North Carolina. When we boarded the train with Coach Steer and our team manager, Mr. Mr. Harris, 
we were all a little nervous, but also very excited. None of us had ever traveled so far from home before. All I knew about North Carolina was that it was south of Massachusetts. We knew something was wrong just after the train pulled into Gastonia. The band that had been playing walked off as soon as they saw Bunny step onto the platform. Then the bus pulled away, leaving us stranded. We had to carry our bags and equipment all the way to the hotel. When we got to the hotel, the manager told Mr. Harris, colored folks ain't allowed to sleep here. So we've arranged for your boy to stay in the local Negro doctor. Bunny is a member of this team, Mr. Harris replied. Where the team goes, we go. At that, this point, an official from the American Legion spoke up. Since this law doesn't include servants, can't the boy be registered as the coach's valet? Bunny is not a servant, Coach Steer growled. He's going to be treated like every other member of this team. Then he'll have to sleep in your room on a cot, the manager insisted. We can have no color boy sleeping in a bed for white people. Bunny looked like he wanted to sink through the cracks in the floor. I don't want to cause any trouble, he mumbled. You're not the one causing trouble, Mr. Harris fumed. You deserve to sleep in a real bed, just like everybody else. That afternoon, we held our first practice. More than 2,000 people showed up to watch. There was a bigger crowd than we'd had at all our games back home put together. And were they mad, steaming. You boys done played your last game, one man shouted. Others threatened to tear the shirts off the backs of Bunny, even stepped onto the field. One usher told me that the Ku Klux Klan was planning to kidnap us from the hotel and our families would never hear from us again. Some of the boys were really scared. I was too. Baseball wasn't worth getting killed over. At the time, something deep inside me wanted to prove that we could beat any team in the tournament. Bunny was the first to make a move. He grabbed his bat, stepped up to the plate, and started taking cuts of imaginary pitches. When Coach Steer told us to take our positions on the field, for once, I was glad to be warming the bench. More threats and jeers filled the air as Coach made his way to the mound. Batter up, he called. Bunny lined the first pitch over the left field fence. That silenced the crowd, but only for a second. Coach Steer threw his second pitch and Bunny airmailed that one out of the park too. Special delivery to the people of Gastonia. The more noise the crowd made, the smoother Bunny swung. He hit six home runs on six pitches. That's when it started raining. Soda bottles, tin cans, and half-eaten hot dogs. More trouble greeted us when we got back to the hotel. The teams from Maryland and Florida announced that they wouldn't play against us if Bonnie was allowed on the field. We also found out that we couldn't go to the welcome banquet if Bonnie was with the team. To make matters worse, the American Legion off official didn't think the policy would be able to protect us from the crowds. Your boy is the only Negro player in the tournament he told Mr. Harris. What if he hits a batter with a pitch? What if he slides into somebody saying to steal a base? 
What if Bunny pitches a no-hitter? Mr. Harris snapped back. What if he scores the winning run? That evening, Coach Steer called another team meeting. He gave us it to us straight. You have a decision to make. You can either play without Bunny or you can pack your bags and go home. If you leave now, the national finals in Chicago are out. The choice is yours. Tony King, our team captain, spoke first. Bunny has broken every one of Tony's records from the summer before, but he didn't hes hesitate. There is no choice. Bunny is a member of this team. If he doesn't play, Neither do I. I knew I could have pitched us to, to victory in Gastonia, but I also voted to go home. So did every other player. Bunny came through for all of us, all of us, summer long, and now it was our turn to do the same for him. That night, we stuck out of the hotel and caught a train heading north. It had to make a special stop just for us. Bunny was the first to speak. I know you guys wanted that championship as bad as I did, but having teammates like you is more important than winning any ball game. You guys aren't just teammates, you're friends, the best friends anyone could have. News of what happened in North Carolina reached Springfield before we did. When the train pulled into Union Station, a huge crowd, even bigger than the one in Gastonia, was waiting to greet us. The people cheered wildly and held up signs calling us heroes and champs. Flashbulbs lit up the night like fireworks. Looking back now, nothing we did on any ball field compares with what we did on that night on August the 23rd, 1934. Long before anyone had ever heard of Jackie Robinson, a team of 15-year-old kids from Springfield, Massachusetts, chose loyalty and respect over championships. Without swinging a single bat, we'd hit a home run. Not just for Bunny, but for people everywhere. Wasn't that a great and moving story? And they were brave and really talented young people. Thank goodness things have changed. Now, our second book for the night. When I was growing up, or actually quite young, my mother always used to read me bedtime stories, and I always looked forward to that. But these were, they were fairy stories, they were called in those days. And most of them were written in England, although I'm sure a few came from other countries as well. But tonight, I'd like to read one called Idle Jack. A boy called Jack once lived with his mother in a little hut on a lonely moorland. His mother was very poor and made some money by spinning. Jack was a big, strong lad, but he was a little bit lazy and to do anything about it to help. In the summer, he laid out in the soft heather and gazed at the cloudless sky above him. In the winter, he sat huddled by the fireside and he never went out at all. I've had enough of you, his mother said one morning. I can't bear you sitting around all day doing nothing. Be off with you. Oh, mother, Jack said, give me a chance. 
I'll get a job, really I will. See, you'll be so proud of me. Well, see that you do then, his mother said. Off to work on Monday, my lad. Jack sulked all weekend. But on Monday, his mother pushed him out of the door. A kindly farmer took pity on Jack when he found him wandering in his yard. I'll give you some work, he said. You can take care of the sheep. I'll give you sixpence for it. So Jack watched the sheep all day and the father gave him six pennies. Jack had never seen pennies before in all his life, so he did not know what they were. On the way home, he jumped over a brook and the money dropped into the water and he never saw it again. You stupid boy, his mother said. You must put anything you earn in your pocket. I'll try, mumbled Jack. It was all very confusing. On Tuesday, Jack went to work for another farmer who asked him to pour the milk into jugs for him. At the end of the day, he gave Jack a jug of milk for payment. Remembering what his mother said, Jack put the jug of milk in his pocket. <laughs> As he ran home, the jug slipped and all the milk spilt over his clothing. You are a mess, said his mother. You've wasted a whole jug of good milk. You stupid, stupid boy. Next time, carry it on your head. All right, mother, said Jack. He couldn't do anything right. The farmer gave Jack another job next day and gave him a pound of cream cheese as a payment. Jack was going to put it in his pocket when he remembered his mother's words and put it on top of his head. As he rain, ran home, the sun beat down and the cheese melted and all he had to show for his work was a head full of cream cheese. What shall I do with you, wailed his mother. Go and wash your hair. You should have carried it in your hands. Remember in future. So Jack left the farmer and went to work for a baker. The baker was a mean man. He soon saw how stupid Jack was and gave him a splitting Tom Cat as his payment. Poor Jack carried the spitting, scratching cat in his arms all the way home. The cat struggled and squirmed and bit Jack. So when he reached home, he had to let it go. He had nothing at all. Oh, what next, exclaimed his mother. There you are, all scratched and sore, and a day's work and no pay. You should have tied a string on it and dragged it home with you. Jack tried working for a butcher next day. He worked well, and the butcher was so grateful, he gave him a large leg of land to take home as a payment. Jack, remembering what his mother had said, <coughs> asked for him a piece of string. Wow, but, what a wonderful story. I wish we had more time to hear the rest of it. Next time. Next time. Isn't she absolutely wonderful? This Thank is Jean you. Kelly, Thank retired you. librarian from Plainville. Wasn't that great? I love this story. I was falling asleep myself. How about you? <laughs> Tune in next week for Christine's Corner. Thank you, Jean. Thank you Come very back again. much. It's a delight to be here. Yeah, I could tell. And I love your reading. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you.